Hey guys, Randall with Always Adaptive here, and today we're going to be talking about that pesky back pain that's been bothering you for the past year. I'll show you a couple ways to get rid of it, and we're going to get into it right now. So from an anatomical standpoint, there's a way that we are supposed to move. When moving in this way, we can heal most of the chronic pain and even acute injuries that occur in the body over time. Before we get into it though, if you'd like to receive tips on how to avoid injury, get rid of pain, get some nutrition advice, some movement advice, and some exercise advice, then go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below and go ahead and like this video. So if my back, knee, or ankle was bothering me and I went to the doctor, they would probably tell me to stop training. Also, depending on where I went, the doctor might even recommend surgery. Now, I don't know about you, but cutting training is out of the question for me. So I've hurt my back a number of times outside of the gym, and trust me, I wanted to take some time off. But me being a personal trainer required me to get back into it as soon as possible. Without me being in the gym, I can't make a living. So through my own experience and the experience of my clients, I found and truly believe that practicing functional movement patterns that fall in line with our bodies from an anatomical standpoint is not only healing, but extremely beneficial to athletes and competitive lifters as well. You see, our bodies are built to deadlift, squat, run, jump, and they're built to do these things in the most efficient way possible. So most times, chronic pain that's not a cause of chronic inflammation is usually a case of the wrong muscles being tight and the right muscles being weak. I emphasize that most because if you're putting a bunch of bullshit in your body, Chances are it's built up some inflammation and that's what's causing your pain. Think of tightness as dysfunctional strength in the wrong muscles. You see, there's a relationship between muscles. A pair of muscles is called an antagonist pair. So a good example of this would be the bicep and the tricep. The bicep is the agonist, the tricep is the antagonist. When the bicep flexes to bend the elbow, the tricep on the other side relaxes and allows that elbow flexion to happen. Now a good example of dysfunction that can occur in these antagonist pairs is between the hip flexors and the glutes. So while we're sitting down, the hip flexors, mainly the psoas, become shortened and the glutes on the back of the body, your butt, become lengthened. Our body adapts to this over time seated position the way that it adapts to any stress. It wants to be extremely efficient. So over time, it strengthens the hip flexors and weakens the glutes. So what this means for you and your back pain is that when you go to stand up now, your hip flexors are too strong, your glutes are too weak, so your glutes can't do their job. Your hips remain in a tiny degree of flexion and instead of being able to fully extend, you crank your lower back instead. So here we have a marching pattern that we use to help clients get a feel for pushing to the ground which in turn allows them to extend their hips a little bit better. We have the band around my neck to help me push back into, which is gonna put my head in a better position. Here we have an ace bandage around my neck, replacing the band. The band is now around my hips, encouraging me to thrust my hips forward. And then here, we have a band around my lower back to control that cranking that I was talking about, as you can see I was demonstrating. We have the band pulling me backwards, encouraging me to push down. Another dysfunctional example of this is forward head posture. And you see it all the time. Now this comes from people that have IT jobs mainly, and they're sitting too close to their computer. What ends up happening is that all the muscles on the back of the neck here get too strong. Your upper trapezius muscles and your levator scapula start to contract over time. They, again, they get strong, and then the muscles responsible for neck flexion, mainly your scalenes and your sternocleidomastoid muscles become weak. So you end up with lengthened muscles here and tight, strong muscles here. Now this can also lead to lower back pain. When you have this excessive forward head posture, then most times we also have an excessive rounding of the thoracic spine. Hopefully you guys can see this. When we have this excessive rounding of the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine overcompensates by craking because this thoracic spine can't extend and do its job. In order to get the head back into a good position, we have to find a way of extending your thoracic spine. Unfortunately, with the muscles responsible for neck extension too strong, your upper trapezius, extending thoracic spine would only put your head in an awkward position. So that's why it's important to not only work on extension of the thoracic spine, but work on the flexors of the neck as well. So here we have another group of movements for you. Now this is just basic head control. As you can see, I'm extending my cervical spine, my neck, 
and flexing my cervical spine. So when I tuck my chin there, that cervical flexion, I'm lengthening the muscles on the back of my neck, my upper trapezius, and I'm strengthening the flexors of my neck, the scalenes and the sternocleidomastoid muscles. Now here we're adding a band for feedback. Now think of this as adding a weight to a hip hinge. So I'm loading this pattern now, making it a little bit harder and therefore make, making my ability to flex my neck a little bit stronger. And here we're doing the same stuff but from the opposite position. So not only do I have the band resisting my ability to extend, but I also have gravity pulling down on my head. So this is great for loosening up your neck while your thoracic spine is extended. And this is just something you can do to start to load your thoracic extension. Now I fully believe that practicing a movement daily can have a tremendous impact on the tightness or strength of those muscles. Every movement you make, your body builds something called a motor pathway to remember it. The more you do that particular movement, the more your nervous system myelinates that pathway. Think of myelination as building a protective sheath over that pathway. Now the next time you go to use that specific movement or exercise, your body is like, oh, I remember how to do this and uses that specific pathway. Even if you don't have full range of motion with a specific movement, simply practicing that movement over and over again, over time, will start to loosen up those wrong muscles and the right muscles will start to become strong again. Once you've regained full range of motion in that specific movement, you can start to load it with bands like you saw earlier. What this means for lower back pain is once your hip flexors gain increased range of motion and are able to lengthen fully again, then your glutes are able to do their job. They're able to fire when they need to and that's what'll end up extending your hips as opposed to you cranking your lower back again. Now obviously you can use the few movements that I showed in this video, but if you wanna take it a step further and you're not local to me, there are tools available to you guys that you can use to find a functional movement specialist like myself. If you go to www.functionalmovement.com slash members and type in your zip code, it'll show you all the functional movement specialists in your specific area. I would just make sure that you specify to them that you're looking for a functional movement routine that you can practice every day. Now this is where I get a little serious with you guys. I think the real takeaway here is to move as much as possible and move every day. Now a lot of people have these Fitbit watches. I use it too, it's kind of fun. It's cool for me to interact with my clients. But a lot of people think that 10,000 steps is exercise. Let's get one thing clear, 10,000 steps is not exercise. 10,000 steps is a baseline. That's human movement. Now let's get into some math. Let's say the average commute to work is about a half an hour. Then you have eight hours of work and then another half an hour for lunch. So that's nine hours. And then we'll add in just another hour of TV time, so that's extra sitting. So that comes out to 50 hours of sitting each week, not including the weekends. So unless you're a type of person that goes out hiking on the weekends, chances are you're probably sitting on your ass, playing video games, watching TV, whatever. Now let's say you have a daily functional movement routine that you're practicing that takes 10 minutes, and you're doing this every day. Now add that up. That's an hour and 10 minutes. So let's compare 50 hours to an hour and 10 minutes. That's fucking nothing compared to how much we're sitting. Add in an hour of exercise three days a week and we're still just adding a drop to the bucket. Not to mention the people that when they exercise, they're doing seated cable machines. So even though they're working out, they're still sitting down. So they're basically getting strong while seated. There's hardly any carryover to when you're standing up. But hey, at least they're doing something, right? Anyways, I hope all this made sense to everyone. I'm very passionate about movement, and I want to get as many people as possible out of that place of pain. Thanks so much for watching, guys. If you liked the video, go ahead and like the video down below. So make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure the alarm is on so you get alerted the next time I release a video. So now it's time for the question of the day. So if you hurt your back, what did you do to get back into the gym? <laughs>